Today we have Ramesh Munasekara talking about evaluating International Booker Prize 2024 and his journey as a reader and writer. Ramesh Munasekara was born in Colombo and lives in London. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature. He is internationally acclaimed for fiction that explores the key themes of our times, political, ecological and economic through novels and short stories of wide appeal. His fiction over the years includes Reef shortlisted for the Booker Prize in 1994, The Match and Noon Tide Tall. His most recent novel Suncatcher returns to an earlier era in Sri Lanka and is a story of divided loyalties and endangered friendships in the turbulent 1960s. He has chaired the Commonwealth Short Story Prize and Gracian Prize in Sri Lanka. He has taught creative writing and run workshops around the world. He is also the co-author of the Writers and Artist Companion to Novel Writing. Welcome to our podcast Ramesh. Thank you for having me on your podcast. I'm it's a pleasure to be here. We will start with uh, you being a reader. How did your journey as a reader start? Glad you have started with this question actually because quite often people ask about how did you start to write as your first question but reading is the first step towards writing for any writer i think and because that's where it all really begins now the thing is although i'm a writer who's very obsessed with memory and things like that even my own early memories are very hazy <laughs> but i do know that from an early age i suppose whenever you start learning to read which i guess must have been read on your own books on your own 7 8 something like that I loved escaping into a world that's a world of written stories. And I know for a lot of us the oral tradition of stories is very important and I do remember listening to stories and that was very important but the mag- real magic for me was reading stories and I suppose going to going to places that were different and wasn't where I was. so there was a kind of magic in that and i wanted to escape into these into a page basically so reading was really important and i read everything i could get my hands on i was as a child growing up in sri lanka ceylon as it was called then and we didn't have tv tv hadn't come to sri lanka in those days i'm talking about 50s 60s so reading rather was the escape and the magic and those days publishers and parents were not so concerned about relevant books books that were about things around you and i feel so lucky because if the books around me were the books about where i was exactly then i don't think i would have read as much because it wouldn't have been an escape the reality was around me anyway so i think i was lucky i was also lucky that i wasn't forced to read school in those days was for me a place to daydream at home i would read comic books adventure books series book any kind of thing but they were not classic children's literature and they weren't the classics either they were the books that lots of people lots of your older readers would recognize the series books it was in english i was reading in english in my school i was my schooling was in sinhala in sri lanka but at home we spoke english so my imaginative life was always english language books and so it was obviously mostly america or england those sorts of books and as a child it would go on then to read westerns and to read spy stories and so in fact my last book suncatcher the novel which is set in the 60s um about two boys growing up there's quite a lot about the kind of reading habits of people like me so that was again not being forced to read was also really helpful because it became my journey my way of discovering the world discovering different things and as a result the story became important that was what was really uh pulling me along and then there were two other kinds of reading stages the second stage was when i was an 
adolescent, I moved. My, my father moved to the Philippines and I went with him. And as an adolescent, I was exposed to a completely different world as a result. It was, again, an English-speaking world because, again, at that time in the Philippines, English was very widely spoken and it was, in a sense, the language in which everything happened. It's less so now, but it was also heavily American-influenced unlike almost anywhere else in Asia at the time. Again, this was in the 60s, and it was Hispanic as well. It was the other side of it, its colonial influence. But what happened for reading was that I discovered American writers who were living writers, and the beat generation, those sorts of writers, who proclaimed their writingness, as it were. So I read about writing, and that's where I guess I wanted suddenly to become a writer. I wanted to write for myself. And then the third stage of reading was when I came to England. So when I came to England, I think that, the, the, again, to go on the reading journey, it was where what really made a big difference was the public library system, which in the 70s in, this, in, in Britain, where I now live, the library system was functioning really well. There were lots of books, libraries bought books, and there were many libraries around, which unfortunately is not so true now. But at that time, I remember when I arrived, I joined every library I could get to on a bus from where I was living, and I could go and read indiscriminately. Yeah, I just went and just would get six books from a shelf without even looking at what they were, take them home, and another six from the next library, and another six from the next library. And I suppose I I discovered there that reading and writing uh, could be something that lasted a little longer than just the immediate moment. And that's when I decided or wanted to, to write books that might get published and read and do what it was doing for me. Uh, so in a way, that was where I became the kind of writer that I am. And, and ever since then, I suppose, I've been reading partly really to understand how to write better. Can you recall the exact moment uh, when you decided to become a full-time writer? I always wanted to be... I didn't think in terms of full-time writer. I, I always wanted to write books. And so Sri Lanka or Ceylon made me a reader. The Philippines made me want to write, and I guess when I came here, I tried to become a writer. But I also assumed that's a long process and that you would have to do other jobs to survive. The decision to become a, a full-time writer is probably more related to one of your later questions, but let's deal with it now. It happened really after my first novel, Reef, was shortlisted for the Booker. And I used to, after that, much to my surprise, and I used to get interviewed a lot. And for the next couple of years, while I was writing the next book, and one of the questions that always came up in these interviews was, how do you find the time to write if you're working full-time? I find the time. People that I admired as writers have always had a hard time finding time. William Faulkner used to work, you know, has to get up at four o'clock in the morning to write. So I used to get up at four o'clock, five o'clock and write. But I came to believe that actually this is an untenable way of, writing, of surviving. So eventually one day, I, my second novel, I realized I would never finish if I was working full time. So I gave up the day job. I was confident enough to do that because of the way the first book went, right, Reef. But then the first interview I had after I gave up my day job, the first question was, how do you manage? Do you really think you can make a living as a writer without a job? <laughs> <laughs> so immediately I was worried. <laughs> and I've been worried ever since even though that was now 30 years ago. <laughs> the novel, your 1994 novel, Reef, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. Uh, tell us about uh, novel Reef. 
Reef is a story, it begins in the 90s. The opening scene is set in a petrol station in London. In fact, it's quite a, almost an autobiographical sec, little section, couple of pages, because there's a petrol station just about half a mile down the road from here, which I used to go to. And a lot of the petrol stations around here in North London were staffed by Sri Lankans, exiled Sri Lankans. And on some, and one group of stations used to be manned by Sri Lankan Tamils who were leaving the civil war. And the other ones were manned by Sri Lankan Sinhalese who were also leaving for other reasons because there was a lot of trouble in Sri Lanka at the time. And I remember going into one of these to fill up my car with petrol and the man who was meant to take my money had just arrived in the country and got this job. He was, he was a Tamil man. He spoke very little English and I don't speak Tamil, but he basically could, he had trouble with the till. He couldn't make it work. So he asked me that I could help him make it work so that I could pay him. <laughs> so I had to go inside and then I had to talk to his boss on the telephone to try and find out how to work this and for him to interpret what I was saying and so on. So it was a very interesting moment. So I put that in the book as the opening. And from there, we go back to the story of this person who has come to the petrol station to fill his tank. How did he get here? And his story is not my story at all. It's the story of a boy who works as a houseboy in Colombo in the 1960s and how he grows up in this house and becomes not just the houseboy, but the kind of the chef of the house and the person who, like the major domo, who runs everything in the house. And eventually he and his boss leave Sri Lanka and come to, to London, where this original houseboy becomes, uh, he opens a restaurant and he becomes a reasonably well to do person here. But the story is about his growing up days in Sri Lanka as a houseboy and the difficulties he faced, challenges he faces. I didn't realize it at the time. Readers tell me it's a very funny book. There's a lot of humor in it. And it's about power, how someone who is powerless to begin with gains power out of their talents and their uh, gifts, if you like, in his case. He discovers he's a chef. And in a way, it's a bit like me. Although it's not my story, discovering that I'm a writer. That's what I can do. So after getting shortlisted, how did it change you personally and also as a writer? The biggest change was that what I said a little earlier about it gave me the confidence to give up the day job, <laughs> which was probably a mistake at the time, but <laughs> right. maybe not. <laughs> Uh, no, it wasn't a mistake. It was the right. It was the right thing to do because I would never have finished the second novel, which was the Sand Glass, which is a different sort of, more complex sort of structure for a novel. But it took me many years to get published. My first book was a book of short stories before Reef called Monkfish Moon, but it took me a long time to get published because. Partly because I didn't write a lot. I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know what to write about. And partly because I was finding out what I can do. And eventually I was writing stories, which I now realize were unlike anything else that was being written at the time. And so when Monkfish Moon came out, it, it made an impression. It was reviewed very widely, unexpectedly. Novels that had a background in South Asia were tended to be not like the books I wrote. Reef, again, is a very slim novel, whereas people were used to even getting used to South Asian writing coming out. But you had Suitable Boy, Midnight's Children. These are big, big books of a different kind. And these were distinctive, my books. And so the impact was that unexpectedly I discovered that there were readers there, out there who were reading my book. I grew up with a 
feeling that when you publish your first book, you'd be lucky if a couple of hundred copies get sold, and most of those would be to the public library system. That was the received wisdom of those days. So when Reef came out, and I, you know, we didn't have internet and email those days, we, I would get letters, and I would get letters from all over the world saying what they found in my book and how it appealed to them. And also, for example, that my writing, my, my writing had a kind of humor in it that I didn't realize when I was doing it. So in a sense, it helped me understand what I can do and what, I, what works for me. So having that readership was a big impact. In, it got a lot of translations in many countries, but not into Tamil, not yet, and not into Sinhala, except now, 30 years later, someone is doing it. <laughs> And it should happen, I think, this year or next. And hopefully this year to come out. But it took a, it's taken a long time. <laughs> so as a writer yourself, uh, how do you view the value add that translator brings? Translator's value is immense, really. Because a translator can, in a sense, make or break you in another language and in another world, for another world of readers, a gifted translator is doing something amazing for a book. It just opens it up to a whole new range of experience. And so I think it's hugely valuable. The, and of course, if the translation isn't good, it's the end of you. You will never live again in that language. <laughs> And sadly, I think it might have happened with me in one or two languages. <laughs> because, of course, unless you know the language, you can't tell either. So you have to trust your publisher and your translator to do the best they can. And reading the books I've been reading for this prize, I can understand you know, how difficult it is eh, and how wonderful it can be. And there are books, of course, that are probably better in translation than in the original <laughs> because... Perhaps an even more gifted writer has done the translation, yes. And it's, it's interesting because we don't always... It's interesting how we think about translation when we, I don't know, when we read the sort of classic Russian writers, for example, Tolstoy, War and Peace. We don't generally think of it as a translation. We think of it as the book. And when you think more about the translation you realize just how complex this is. There are people, there are Russians speaking in French, they're translated into English, there's all these things going on. And in a way, in my first book, Reef, um, Triton was the narrator, the cook. One of the things I was trying to do in that book also was to not deal with translation so much, but to deal with the ownership of language and how you do that. So in that book, Triton is telling the story in English and he's telling the story where he begins with a simpler English and as he grows in confidence he takes over the language and he uses more singular expressions in it and he, he basically takes ownership and that's what we do as writers and that's what we do as readers as well and that's what translators do they take ownership of the book you have been a judge for the current uh, International Booker Competition 2024. Can you tell us about the evaluation guidelines broadly? Very little in the way of guidelines, really. This year was the largest submission, and it was 149 books. Yeah, Those are the books that have been sent in by publishers to be considered for this prize. So we as judges get all of these books. And I have read all 149 some of them, obviously, I've read faster than others. Related to perhaps your other question is, is the reason I agreed to do the prize is because I wanted to read books that I would not otherwise read, especially books that have been written in other languages. And I think these are from about 30 different, lang more than 30 different lang languages. And But the guideline really is for us as judges to collectively come up with 
a list of books that we can recommend that people who are reading in English should read. There's nothing more than that. And really, what that means is that we as judges, and me, I saw it as my responsibility to be as open as I possibly can be. Because what we're trying to discover is what writers in other languages might be trying to do with fiction and what their ideas about fiction, what their traditions of fiction, their influences may be very different. And that means you have to be open to new forms of writing, new structures, new content, new ideas. Uh, and that's very exciting. So now when you're evaluating the work, uh, you can only evaluate it uh, independently, right? Independently as a book because you wouldn't be reading the source anyway. So is there any way to understand uh, how good the translation is? I suppose it's difficult to say whether if a book isn't succeeding in its own in its own way, whatever it's trying to do, if it's not succeeding in that, the question then, is that because the translator isn't good or is it because the origin well, wasn't conceived properly? Maybe you can't quite draw the line exactly where, but at the same time, the books that do work best, you can see that if the translation isn't good, it will show if, if there's a if there's a, there are problems in the language that's being used or in the way the language is being used. You can also see where, obviously, some there are, I'm not a translator myself, but one of our panel is. But we didn't necessarily talk about the kind of philosophical aspects of translation. But I know that there are different schools of translation, how you approach translation, whether you try to evoke the same thing in a different language. And many of these books actually have some comment or afterward by a translator explaining what the problems were that they had to deal with. And those I found fascinating as well. So you get a feel for whether the translation itself is succeeding or not. But on the whole, we were looking at what you're looking for is, does this, is this a book that you can, that gives you something when you read it? It gives you some, and is worth looking at again. So this 149 books that you had to read, how much time was given to you before you had to announce the long list? I suppose we've been, we were getting these books from last, I can't remember exactly, maybe August or so, August, September. We didn't get all at the same time. We get We got them in batches. But it means that I've been reading... I've been reading other people's fiction every day for the last nine months, eight months, which I haven't, which is not my normal life. <laughs> my normal life, I read quite a lot of what I've written because I'm always editing, revising what I'm writing. I'm a very slow writer in that sense. Uh, I'm always writing a book. And even while I'm doing this reading, I'm writing a book as well. That's the way I spent my life, uh, doing other jobs while I'm writing as well. I don't think it's a good thing to spend all your day writing. <laughs> any specific trends or uh, any innovative innovativeness in terms of theme, structure, form, or anything that you have observed as a whole? If we widen it, not just the 13, uh, it's easier to see uh, trends in, in, in the in the whole lot. Um, and my impression, I think, is that actually, to my surprise, perhaps, um, very much like what you find in English language writing, fiction these days, there is perhaps a kind of drawing in of the fictional world. It's a, there's a kind of tendency to be for writers to be looking at things that are closer or themselves much more than say i don't know 30 years ago or whatever and i don't know why that is it may be because of the predominance of film which deals with the external world very very easily 
or maybe it's because we all live a little bit more online and in ourselves or something to do with the lifestyle of the modern world maybe but there is a sense in which there is a kind of focus that is somehow a bit to me a bit closer in that and it's true of english language fiction as well i think there's there is an element of that anyway and the other thing which again is shared in english language writing as well is a blurring of the boundaries of fiction and non-fiction and a general blurring of the boundaries so that it's sometimes difficult to say what where the fiction is and where the non-fiction is now that's not new because always be writers have used themselves for their fiction and have used their own experience for fiction right from the beginning of writing but maybe the difference is that there's less perhaps importance placed on the idea of transforming that experience so that i would say is a, a tendency that's there it's and also a tendency to perhaps be a little experimental in your structures sentence structures paragraphs all of that sort of thing which again is shared in in english language writing as well i suspect there's some of these tendencies are perhaps just the effect of technology and the way we live and i suppose what's interesting and again what's interesting is about looking at this international range is how much in the world if you're a writer writing there's a commonality and i've always said this and i always feel it that there's a in the world there are many divisions and sadly i think too many divisions and everyone tends to think of themselves as special but one of the divisions that isn't often talked about is group of people in the world and it is a minority group really but it's a large minority group but they are the people who for whom the written word is important and a writer and a reader share something and they're unified in this it makes them very different from the person who is not a reader or a writer and their worlds are very different and to me when i read all these novels from different parts of the world you can sense the writer behind each one of them and we are all brothers and sisters we are all in that family of people for whom the written word is magic in some way some very different sorts of magic but it is magic you put it beautifully you have been a judge on many panels is there any specific experience uh, related to this particular competition that you'd like to share yeah i think it is to do with that to me it's a privilege for me to have had this opportunity at the to glimpse these other worlds which in theory are very different these different language worlds and do i judge quite a lot of prizes and awards and big kind of things which all have helped me understand a little bit more about what fiction is how it works what's important in a book and that feeds me and my own imagination but what's different about this round is because it is looking at these different languages and different ways i do a lot of workshops around the world and i mentor writers aspiring writers and one of the things i get from from that sort of thing is uh, an interaction with different imaginations which is very important to me it's with in workshops or with students or with mentees looking at writing in its rawest form brings me right back to where we started when i started out writing it wasn't to get published it was because i liked writing there were people around me who were not writers so i was a sort of scribe but it meant that my teenage angst could come out in poems or whatever but it it had to be more than that it had to entertain other people around me 
And we could talk about writing and what's on a page without the paraphernalia of publishing, reviews, prizes, any of that. Just what's a good sentence? What's a good, what's a good story? And to be able to do that with writers who have published books from all over the world, to me, was is great. And to be able to have that discussion with this panel, which is a wonderful panel of very different people from different parts of the world. We all live in different parts of the world. We meet on online mostly, but we have met in person as well. Artists, translators, poets, and the conversation is very stimulating. And it helps me understand and learn about how a story can be told, ways I didn't think of before, and even what is a story. And these are things that, I don't know, I'm sure doing what you do, you would love it as well. It's very stimulating to be able to talk about books and writing and talk about it in this protected environment. So it's, again, being part of the magic. If I may ask you, what exactly happens between long listing and short listing? Not only have, do you read those books the first time round, we then read the long listed books again. And the thing about the reason why these discussions are so important is, and so stimulating, is that you listen to somebody else talking about a book that you may think is okay, but doesn't do anything for you. And then they open your eyes to look at it in a different way. And why, why are they passionate about this book? You suddenly realize, oh, I didn't know how to read this book. And that's part of what I find really interesting is that I'm learning how to read, even after having spent the last, what, 50 years writing and reading. I still I'm learning. And yeah, so that's what happens. You revisit these books. And after the shortlisting, we'll have to revisit them for a third time. And I think that's important. And that makes a big difference because to me, a good book has to survive rereading. A really good book actually is enriched by rereading and rereading again. The books that I started reading as a boy, where you read it, consume it. Actually, as a boy, you might reread it again. As a child, you might reread it again and again, uh, because you're just you just like it. But there are many other books that you read for the pure entertainment, and that's it. You don't really want to re read it. And there are other books where actually the book itself is telling you, "No, you haven't got everything out of me yet," and. It reminds me how difficult it is, not everybody shares this, this is my view really, how difficult it is to write a good sentence. Even a very simple good sentence has to be very strong. To me, it's like building a bridge. It has to be really, and we know how bridges collapse, we've heard about it. Sentences collapse if you look at it too often. And it has to be a really good sentence that can survive that. And to me, when I'm writing, that's what I'm, I'm writing, I want my writing to be of that sort that can survive being looked at again and again. This is my final question. What are you currently working on? What are you writing? Writing my next novel. I have, I have many literary projects on all the time, but at the moment there, there is a novel I'm trying to get into its final shape. I've been writing it for a I don't know. My last book came out just before COVID. In 20, I would have started writing the next book pretty much then. In fact, I had two books I was interested in. So I did a little bit of one and a little bit of the other. And now I'm concentrating on one of them to try and bring it to its final shape. It, it, it's finished, but it, in terms of I had the story, but I'm now rewriting it for the umpteenth time I... I rewrite my, my book many times before they get to their final shape. So I reread them a lot. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Even if nobody else does. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ramesh, for such a stimulating conversation. Thank you, Arun. It's been a pleasure.